So we continue our series on the membership vows of our church. Um, Will you faithfully participate in the ministries of King Avenue Church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? This is obviously service. The parable that Lowell just read couldn't be clearer. Uh, It's painfully clear. A parent had two children, said to the first, go serve in the vineyard. And the child said, yes, I will, and then changed its mind and didn't. Second child, go serve in the vineyard. No, I won't. Changed its mind and went. Which one did the will of the father? Well, it's obvious the one who went and worked in the vineyard. What's painful for me is I realize how often I am the first son, uh, the son that says, yes, I'll serve, and doesn't. A couple weeks ago, uh, I, we got in our mailbox, maybe the rest of you did too, a, a brown paper bag that uh, wrote, had written on it, Please fill this bag with with food, and on Saturday, your mail carrier will pick it up and give it to a food pantry. And Susan said, well, should we fill it up? And I said, no, we don't need to. Uh, We give to the NEMAP food pantry. And Susan said, when do we do that? Uh, And I said, well, we did a couple years ago. (laughs) I announce it enough, we see it enough, we hear it enough, that I have deceived myself into thinking I'm actually doing it. I talk enough about service that I think I'm actually serving when I'm not. Um, Why, and you might be sitting there thinking now, oh my gosh, I said yes to that committee. I said yes, I'd support that person. I said yes, I'd go to this place, and I didn't. Why are we like that first child that says yes and then doesn't? Well, we forget. We have other priorities. It might be we realize out of our comfort zone and we just don't feel comfortable doing it. It could be that we want to get rid of the person who asked us. If I just say yes, they'll go away and then I can do what I want to do. By the way, that's what I heard is one definition of a passive-aggressive person. The person who says yes and then goes ahead and does what they want to do anyway. Um, It is clear that given a choice, we'd prefer that other child, the one who says no, but then changes its mind and goes and serves. I mean, I know I've been on projects in almost every church I've served where we're, we're painting a, a fellowship hall or we're setting up tables or we're doing a rummage or something, and, and you know, we don't have enough volunteers. Too many people have said no, and it's taking too long, and we're getting tired. And then finally, somebody who said no shows up. And they're like the conquering hero. Thank God you showed up. You saved us. You wonder if that's why they said no in the first place, so they'd be treated like a great hero. Um, I do see problems with the person who says no and serves. Uh, You know, sometimes when that person says no, it discourages other people from volunteering, and the project never gets off the ground. So it is important to say yes, but it's important to say yes and be committed and do yes. I just want to say there's probably a a third child in here, and that's the child who never, never answers in the the first place. Um, I'm often that child too. You know, you get that email asking you to do something. You get that voicemail asking you to do something. You see something in the bulletin. And you just never respond. You never say yes or no. You just can't be pinned down. 
that's a, that's a tough one, and it's, it's sometimes a place where I like to be, and I hope, well, somebody else will step up. Last Sunday, um, many of you said, well, John, you had an easy Sunday. You didn't have a sermon. Yes, I did. I had a sermon at 9 o'clock. You all who come at 11 missed the blessing of that sermon. Um, some people say it was the best sermon ever preached at King Avenue, <laughs> but you missed it. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I'm going to recap it now. Now, what I said is that the five love languages that are written about in that book, the five love languages, are somewhat similar to our membership vows. The five love lang languages are quality time, uh, gifts, service, physical touch, and um, words of affirmation. And those are awful close to the membership vows, but we never think of the membership vows as love language. But we think of these other things as love language. And service is a love language. It's not just what we do, it's how we do it. And we know people that do things of service that can be very manipulative, very um, uh, uh, exploitative, very guilt-provoking. There's also gifts of service that are done as love. I mean, we know the difference between a nurse who cares for us, serves us with love, and one who just serves us as a job. We know love language when we're sick, and a friend or a partner goes out of their way to care for us, to provide transportation, to run errands, to bring food in. It's that love language, language where they don't have to do it, but they do. When we speak the love language of service, we're not focused on ourselves. We are focused on the other. And we're not focused on what we get out of it. We're focused on what we can give and what they receive. That's service. When, when Paul talks about service, he talks about it um, in terms of fitting in and belonging. You know, and service is, in the church, maybe the easiest way to fit in and belong and connect. Certainly it is for extroverts. To serve is an easy way to break the ice and get to know people. Yeah. When Paul talks about service, he talks about maturity. That service is done in love, in patience, in forbearance, in humility, it's that other directed stuff, it's that how we do it stuff, and it's those qualities that help us mature. Anne talked about it as service as a way that she learned the gospel. She learned the gospel by doing it. And service is how we learn the gospel. We learn it by doing it, by loving others and putting others first. When Paul um, talks about uh, service, he talks about the parts of the church coming together and creating a unified whole. That whole can be expressed, you know, as as a as a body. And that's the illustration he most commonly uses, the body of Christ 
where each piece of the body, each part of the body, does its function. And, and some get more glory than others, some get more attention than others, but each part is important. You know, when you think of service in the church, yes, it's a body that works together. But you can think of it also, that service body, as working together for habitat for humanity. According to the grace given you, some of you are very skilled and can do almost anything. Others are really unskilled and can do nothing but pick up scraps of wood. Others make meals. Others do finishing work. Others prepare the ground. But each, each person comes together to make a whole, one organism. Choirs, you know, come together in service. Hubbard tutors come together in service. King Avenue players come together in service. The kitchen cabinet comes together. Some know everything they can do in the kitchen. Others know nothing, and all they can do is empty the trash. But each group is important in the body. I have um, put in the bulletin an incomplete list of service opportunities in the church. And I'd encourage you to pull that out and look at it, take it home, circle the service where you'd like to connect, where you'd like to fit in. Um, and we'll find that place for you. One translation of um, this passage from Ephesians is, um, it's a paraphrase where the, where the, the, the translator talks about the image of, of coming together in service where all the parts are needed. He talks about it as a dance where we move gracefully and rhythmically together. You know, it's a dance. And when you think of a dance, all the parts do come together to make the whole. We went to um, see the Columbus Dance Theater uh, in its premier performance of Our Town. I was interested to go to see the ballet of Our Town because I couldn't imagine how you'd do a ballet of Our Town. Um, and it was really well done with visuals, with costumes, with music, and with the dancers. And it involved all ages, the children who are in the dance school up to the professionals and, and some people from outside the dance, people who live in the community. And it, it included musicians and it included um, uh, photographers and videographers and it was a multimedia presentation. And it was, it was thrilling, and it was uplifting, and it kind of brought the whole audience together. Uh, and, and, and we felt really good about it, and we had experienced something wonderful. And I thought, you know, the one person you don't see here is maybe the most important person in this production. The artistic director, the choreographer, who put it together, who had the vision for all these pieces to come together. And after I thanked, uh, after the performance and thanked some of the dancers whom we knew, I really wanted to talk to the artistic director and I wanted to thank the artistic director for his vision and his work in putting this all together. When I think of service in the church, there's one entity we do not see that pulls it all together. And that's God. But it's God's vision and it's God's direction that brings it together. Paul says in Ephesians, through that work together, that service together, people know there's one God. There's one God bringing it together. 
I wanted to thank that artistic director. And when churches are involved together in service, people want to thank not only those in service, but they want to thank the artistic director that puts together that work of art. Our service is not only a gift of love, it's a work of art made to God that others see its beauty. Amen.